Hey everyone, uh, this video will um, introduce you to some critical theories that we're going to use for writing assignment two and also use um, in other places throughout the semester. So what you see on the screen is the critical theory um, material that we're going to look at on the left and then a picture uh, painting from uh, Velazquez, Diego Velazquez, uh, Las Meninas that we'll be looking at as our example along with the example from a piece of literature in the lecture itself. So let's get started. Now critical theories, um, sometimes called lenses, um, are ways that we can examine artifacts. In uh, today's example we're looking at a painting and at a short story. And by looking at these works of art from different directions, um, it gives us kind of a fuller picture of the, the, the artifact. So um, we're going to look at uh, biographical studies, and each one of these is kind of their own, uh, can be their own art field in and of itself, but uh, theorists and scholars look at very specific things in the artwork that they're examining, um, but these fields overlap. So you might find a particular scholar is um, solely interested in a Marxist view of Velazquez's paintings, or he might look at Marxism and feminism together. So again, they're just tools to help us understand it. This is not anything that the artist him or herself was aware of when they were putting the work together. This is, these are tools that scholars use to look at those works. All right. So it's not appropriate to say Velazquez was using a feminist approach in his painting because that wouldn't even have been terminology available to him at that time. Right? These are approaches that the scholars use. All right, so you see a number of them here. Biography, cultural historical studies, Marxism, feminist and gender studies, psychology, genre studies, archetypal and mythological studies. So we'll get started and I suspect I'll probably have to stop the tape somewhere in the middle and make a second a part two to this video because I suspect it will be too long. Well, let's start with biography. Now, we're going to be looking at Kate Chopin's 1894 short story um, called Story of an Hour. And it might be helpful for you to go ahead and read that story. It's only like a page and a half long. It's an extremely short story. Or if you don't want to do that, um, you can uh, review the summary. I provided a, sm a Smoops uh, link for you to give you a summary of the events taking place in that story. Here we go, biography. So a person who is interested in biographical critical studies would um, suggest that you could not understand the work by an artist, be it literature or sculpture or music, um, without understanding the author, him or herself. So in this case, we're looking at a short story about by Kate Chopin. Um, and this work is in your reader, so you can always look at it there and look at some of the background biographical information. Um, but we might um, say that the story itself is influenced by events that may have occurred in Chopin's life or it's set in New Orleans because that's where she spent some of her life. Um, so th these scholars say that it's difficult to separate an artist from the artist's work. In the painting here of Las Meninas, um, we actually see Velazquez. He's right here. He's the painter. And he's painting this canvas. And we see the back of his canvas here, a very large canvas. And here's the princess. There's the king and queen reflected in this um, mirror back here. So the king and queen would be um, sitting outside of the frame. Everybody's looking at out of, of the painting. They'd be looking at the king and queen. So this is the princess. And these are her two maids in waiting. And this is sort of like the governess there, the, the, the older woman who looks after the princess. Um, I forget who this gentleman is. I think he was some kind of caretaker. Um, I, I don't remember exactly. And then uh, another um, person of some importance in the court. And then we have, I believe she was a cousin to the princess. 
Um, you can tell that she is a, a, a dwarf, which would have had its own meanings in Velasquez's time. And this is a young page boy here who would have run errands and that sort of thing, and obviously the a pet dog. So that's all the players. And we're in a gallery here in the studio. We have lots of other paintings along the wall. Here's a window we can tell. Um, but not a lot of not a lot of light coming in. All right. So Velasquez has uh, the Order of the Templar Knights or something. I forget what order this is that he uh, painted on his chest there in a, um, in a later on um, to kind of update the, the um, painting to include some biographical bits and pieces. So we would look at this painting and say, what do we know about Velasquez's life and how does that reflect in the painting itself? So that's what a biographical critic would look at. So the next thing we can look at is cultural and historical studies. So this would be, again, saying that we couldn't really understand the work being studied unless we understood what was going on in that time period. For example, The um, Story of an Hour was published in 1894, but that doesn't necessarily mean it was written in 19, uh, 1894. I mean, the, the, the plots in the story take place in 1894. Um, an art author can, you know, place a story in any time period he wants, right? But in this case, because of clues in the story, we can assume that a story of an hour took place um, somewhere around this time, the late 19th century. There would have been things culturally that um, Luis Mallard, the, the main character in the story, would and would not have been allowed to do. Um, students tend to look at works from 21st century perspective when that's not really appropriate. Um, she's an unhappy woman and you know, unhappy in her marriage, uh, seemingly childless and just, you know, not, just not a happy person. And it would be inappropriate to say, well, why didn't she just divorce her husband and go off and get a job and get a career? Because those things weren't available to a woman in this time period, right? A, particularly a woman of some middle class stature. Um, she wouldn't have been able to find a job. There were no such things as jobs for women, right? Unless you were a governess or a companion to an older wealthy woman. Um, or lower down on the food chain, you could uh, work in a, a mill or a factory. Um, even lower down, you could be a prostitute, right? So there weren't a lot of uh, things available. So you have to ask the right questions or else you're not going to understand um, the work and the students, the, the, the characters' motivations and actions. Um, so what we would have to understand about this painting is that um, these two young ladies would have to give in to every whim of the princess here. Right, and this one is uh, bringing her some hot chocolate in this particular little little um, jug there. Um, you can see how children were not really treated differently from adults. Right, they dress the same way as adults would. Um, we can kind of see what the social stat uh, uh, stratification would be. You have um, what, what is the role of an artist in this age? And Velasquez was a very um, um, famous artist, and he was painting this particular work for the king's, um, I want to say, sitting room or something like that. So this was a, a, an intimate picture that was not necessarily going to be shared with a lot of people. Um, the, the ladies in waiting, what would their roles have been, where were they culturally uh, in, in, in terms of their, their status, um, did they come from other wealthy families, um, the older woman who's taking care of um, the, the dwarf, all these things would have their particular cultural roles, and we would have to understand those roles to understand the work of art. So let's look at one more here, and I'll stop the video at that point. Marxist studies um, can be very complex, but for our purposes, we can look at just something very basic, and that is the idea of power. Marxist scholars tend to be interested in power struggles, particularly those that have to do with the means of production, who owns them, who gains from them, um, how do they get the power, and how do they stay in power, issues like that. Well, we can look at um, the issues of power in Louise Mallard's situation in the story of an hour, and we mentioned a moment ago that she was a female in a time, a female of a middle, upper, maybe upper middle class um, environment in which she would have very little power, right? Maybe power over the servants in the house with her, 
but um, there's not a lot she could do to change her own world. Her husband would be the one with the most of the power. If she were, and in Louisiana at this time, there were certain laws that if she were to try and get a divorce and maybe had children, um, the husband would get the children. The woman would not necessarily get custody. It's not like our world now. He had the power. If she had brought any money into the marriage, the husband would have had access to that money. It would not necessarily have gone with her. So there were certain economic um, restrictions that a female at this time would have had. Looking back at our um, painting here, all of these are dependents upon the king and his good graces, right? Um, so um, we have the, 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 the cousin who was taken in and kind of brought up with the, the princess here, the Infanta. Um, we have uh, Velasquez dependent upon the goodwill of the king. He, he can't paint just anything he wants. He has to paint what the king will approve of. It's, the king is his patron. Um, so those are the sorts of issues that we would be interested in in a Marxist look. So if I can figure out how to get this uh, turned off here, then we'll uh, do a uh, part two.